Welcome to Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and me, Jim Cunningham. Hey there, Jim. John, my friend, my friend, how are you? I'm good. I can't believe we're back. It's two weeks later. It just uh, happened so fast. It's like every two weeks. Yes. I, I Just like clockwork, it seems like. We're uh, well into season two now. We're episode nine. Very exciting. 209. Yes. Right, yeah, nine. Te- technically, two oh nine. When I when I put it up on the thing, it says uh, you have to fill in all this stuff. What episode is it? Uh, what year uh, year is it? It's year two. What episode nine? But it uh, appears uh, on your screen as episode two oh nine. Not only is it chapter nine, not only is it the ninth episode of uh, season two, but this is also our very first on location interview that we'll be listening to today. It's, it's yeah, we've never, never done that before. before. Yeah, we've never done it before. Well, why would we? Why would we? Exactly. But, but this one is great because this is a, uh, well, do you want to talk about that or what, what do you no, want? Let's to- jump in there. Yeah, we drove, uh, we traveled all the way to Burnsville, Minnesota, which is a staggering 12 miles from my house. I don't know how far it is from you. I don't, I, I can't, uh, I can't, longer, but yeah. not much. But we visited uh, with our good friend and really a godfather to so many magicians in the Minneapolis, St. Paul, Twin Cities area. Larry Kalo, who is the owner and operator of Eagle Magic Store, the longest operating magic store in America. Am I overstating that? I believe you are correct on that. And I believe that Larry himself has been there for about 50 years. Uh, I think we've both been his customers for just about that long. You can do the math on that or not. Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think that's right. In fact, while we were interviewing him and then I re-listened to the interview, I may have been going there before he actually owned the store. And was just a demonstrator. That's, That's how long I've been going there. That's possible. So, yeah, yeah, I'm assuming that the one you went to first was the one in downtown Minneapolis. Oh, not right. The, yeah. Not the New Burnsville location, the oh. one in the Sexton building on Portland Avenue in downtown Minneapolis. And I will say that if any uh, location is a model for uh, Chicago Magic, the store in the Eli Mark series, it's going to be Eagle Magic. Uh, the layout is a little different. Chicago Magic is a little larger in my imagination, even larger than the Burnsville store, but similar layout of gag gifts over here and over there. We've got the books and then here's uh, supplies and then bigger stuff and posters everywhere. What a treasure it is to the Minneapolis St. Paul community really to have a brick and mortar. We have more than one. We have a second one too, Twin City Magic and Costume, which is also a very nice uh, store. But in terms of, um, Oh, uh, nostalgia and length and uh, the amount of time I have spent in magic stores, hands down, it, it, it's eagle. Totally. Yeah. And uh, as as we uh, dive into this chat with Larry, I'll just preface it by saying that, that walking into eagle magic is probably pretty close to what it would feel like to walk into Uncle Harry's store. Welcome to Eagle Magic Store. I'm Larry Kalo, and I'm very happy to be so. Um, I'm just fascinated. Of course, I've been going to Eagle Magic Store for, believe it or not, I think 50 years. I probably came first off with my brother, uh, who's a darn fine magician in his own right. He is. And, uh, and so I've been coming here for 50 years, probably, when I think back on it. How did you come to magic in the first place and you always say it's fun to fool people fun to be fooled it's more fun to be the fooler how'd you get to be the fooler well when i first came here it was with uh, my mother like so often is the case you have mom or the family come in and uh, they make uh, the youngster makes it known that he wants to get down there so it was a uh, with uh, parental participation and how uh, old were you at this point point? and my uh, particular in particular my mother uh uh eight years old eight which is pretty young and what how that came to be was uh she uh my father worked in downtown minneapolis and uh, i was born in minneapolis but uh we moved out to bloomington and uh, my mother had her hair done downtown so we take the bus downtown, and then uh, we we went into Eagle Magic Store, and I had already had a kit, and my father showed me a few magic tricks. So it wasn't an accident that you went into Eagle Magic no, Store. No, I you wanted, sought it out. I wanted to go. Yeah, and w- when I was eight, nine, and ten, uh, I was uh, 
rummaging around in my father's dresser drawer, and I found a gun, a box of condoms, and a deck of cards that was all the king of clubs. And I found, went to my father and I said, what's this? And I'm glad it wasn't the gun. Or it the was condom. The, it was the deck of cards. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you don't want that discussion. He showed me uh, a couple tricks with a one-way deck. And so that was the relationship with my father. My father never took me to Eagle Magic Store, but my mother did, and she'd get her hair done once in a while. And then, uh, so one of the early tricks that I got was a little pillars that had a string going through them, and they had a pivot point at the back end, and you'd cut the thing. And I had a set of a couple of changing knives, and I bought this little pillar thing. You cut the string, you pivot the thing, you see the cut marks on the string, it's cut in half. You put the pillars back together, you wave the knife over it, and now the string has become restored. You wrap that around the pillars, put it in your pocket, go on to your next trick. And uh, so going down there was something that all of a sudden you go like, I'm not going to be able to go down there too often. And I was just always waiting for somebody to make a negative comment about my mother's hair. Because I knew it might be a (laughs) trip. (laughs) And... It was just a lot of fun, and I luckily stumbled onto a magic club being taught by a magician whose name was Bill Boyles. He was an insurance salesman from uh, Minneapolis, and he started a magic club at the Methodist Church in Richfield that we got together every week and uh, talked about magic tricks. And by the time I was 12, I had had numerous visits to Eagle Magic Store, and I had started having a collection of books. And you can, uh, you know, it's difficult to get information out of a book. And I had dyslexia, so this was an undiagnosed illness that I had as a child. And I was always the dumbest person in the class. But you know what? I was the biggest. Not that I pummeled anybody on a regular basis, but that option was there. (laughs) It's nice to have that option on the table. (laughs) So by the time I was 15, I had, you know, dove pans and crystal cylinders and sleeve bouquets and appearing and vanishing uh, canes. And and, uh, I knew that I was going to do magic tricks for a living, and I was out doing shows and uh, getting paid more than the kid that worked at the fast food place or that worked at the gas station. And I'm going like, yeah, I'm going to do this for a living, I think. Well, nowadays and in yesteryear, kids kind of think, and their parents don't even realize, what am I going to do when I grow up? You know, uh, your aunt loves to say that to you, but at some uh, point, this is a serious concern. Yeah. If it's any consolation. It's a concern I still have. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I myself am waiting for the day when I make that final decision. Who who owned Eagle at this point? So you're 15, you've been yeah. going there for yeah. seven, eight years at this point? I went into Eagle Magic Store one day and uh, some fun uh, regarding uh, a new owner in town. And to backtrack a little bit, Collins Pence, who was a farm boy from southern Minnesota, was a uh, knowledgeable guy in the sense that if you grow up on a farm, you know quite a bit of stuff. And he saw Alexander Herman perform in Minneapolis and said, this is something I'd like to pursue. And Penn started Eagle Magic Store in 1899, and he was also interested in early radio and had been messing around with that a little bit. And sometimes you wonder, how do people have more hours in the day than we? because he had this retail situation. He was importing magic tricks from Europe. He was constructing a few things himself. He published a a number of uh, what he called vest pocket magic booklets. Uh, In 1915, he went on to produce a monthly magic magazine called The Eagle Magician. He was printing it himself. Uh, He employed only females because he thought they were more trustworthy. Uh, they were each assigned a cigar box, and when they weren't doing anything else, he would give them paper clips or a spool of wire, and they were instructed to fashion puzzles out of this wire. Um, and he, so this is the guy who created Eagle Magic. Yeah, Collins, Collins Pence, P-E-N-T-Z. And uh, 
So Doris Davids, another woman who worked for Collins Pence, um, was uh, in 1930, started to work for him, and she stuck around. She didn't leave. She kept on keeping on, and all of a sudden she had the keys to the front door, and she was the manager and opening and closing and running the other ladies and trying to get things done. And uh, they ended up having a agreement, Collins Pence and Doris Davids had an agreement where when he wanted to retire, she would be given the store. Wow. And their agreement was that she would take care of him in his old age. And that's exactly what happened. So in 1946, he retired, and Doris had been working for him since 1930, and she was now the owner. And when I was coming downtown as a young adult, I was buying my tricks from her. And she was a nice-looking, mysterious lady that had two female employees. And uh, they would all wear their sweaters over their shoulders, and they looked like capes. And when I would come in, and many times I was in there by myself, I could see through the curtains into the back room, and they were back there cackling playing cards, eating cheese sandwiches, drinking beer. And then uh, they would come out and they say, Larry, how much money do you have to spend? I go like $2. Then they would go over to the close-up mat and they'd take something out. Doris would take a 50 cent piece and she'd display it on both sides. She'd shake it, she'd move it up and down and all of a sudden the coin would vanish. Going like, wow. Then she could grasp it from the air again, like a miser pulling gold out of the air. And then she stuck it behind her hand, and magicians might refer to this as a hand-washing type thing. She puts the coin behind her hand, and she's doing this, and all of a sudden it's gone. Right. And uh, so she taught me how to do that. That cost 50 cents. And now I sell them for $25. <laughs> <laughs> But she taught me to put it on the back of my hand and then close my two hands and mumble them around and then all of a sudden the coin's gone. What you were doing, there was a pin in the coin and you were sticking it in the back of your hand. But she said you don't stick it in the back of your hand, you just balance it with that little pin on your flesh. I used to stick it into my flesh and sure. gouge the back of my flesh. <laughs> Um, stick it on the back of your pants is the way to do it. And then I improved it in such where now I'm showing the coin, I bring it down to my pants leg, I bring my hand up and I do this type of thing, and now the coin is gone, the false transfer type thing. So these terms are such where, you know, you can quiz people now when I interview people when they come in here and their children, I just talk about a couple of things and uh, they... Uh, I can identify where they're at. So uh, it's not on, unlike it, the way it was years ago. So years ago, uh, when somebody would come in and they say, hey, I saw Lou Holtz do the Toronto Restore uh, newspaper at the luncheon. Do you sell that? And I go like, yeah, but not to you. And they take offense to that. These are heads of industry, dignitaries, doctors and lawyers, CEOs. And I go like, yeah, you know what, you won't be able to do it. And I had some real arguments with people, and sometimes they left. But often, if they stayed, I said, boy, do I got something good for you. And I showed them the coloring book trick, where you flip through this book, and it has pictures. They're not colored. And then the magician taps the book or has this invisible colors thrown at the book. And when you thumb through it, the colors are there. They would come back, these guys, and be very thankful that I matched them up with the right thing where I explained to them they won't be able to do where you tear up the newspaper. So the magician, the magic dealer could be the gatekeeper. I mean, I'd sell somebody nickels and dimes before I'd sell them scotch and soda. I would sell somebody a Svengali deck before I'd sell them brainwave deck. So these special little things, the magician who was the magic dealer was the gatekeeper. So I got to monitor what was going on, and there was very few people that would contest that. You know, occasionally somebody got like, now the kid really wants the linking rings. And I said, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to sell them to you. But here's the second part of the equation. When you bring them back and you think you're going to return them, I'm not going to take them back. There you go. The magician, the magic dealer, 
could promote uh, conventions and lectures, and they could promote, I could give people shows, and I did. I gave many magicians many shows. Yeah. I think I even gave Rick a couple yeah, of shows. I'm sure you did. And uh, Rick's a very talented magician and has maintained this lifelong interest, like so often is the case. And why is that? More than likely, it's because of a relationship, or it could be of the magic shop with a magic dealer. Okay, so Larry, you've been now, we're kind of, you're 15, you're coming here, you're refining things that uh, the folks behind the counter are showing you. What's the next step between that and you owning Eagle Magic Store? Well, that's right. I went down, and so you had Collins Pence, Doris Davids, and Doris Davids uh, in the winter of 69 and 70 fell and broke her hip. Mm. So she had been asked by local magicians more than a few times, and several magicians, if you ever want to sell a legal magic store, let me know. Uh, the two ladies that worked for Doris uh, were sometimes there and sometimes not there. I think they worked whenever they wanted to. One was named Vernus, one was named Elsie. They didn't know how to really demonstrate the magic tricks. Uh, they could... Uh, you know, if they did, it lacked any kind of presentation, but they could sell you a rubber chicken or a joy buzzer and put that in a bag. And and uh, so Doris is talking to Tom Little, who was in town just visiting his family members, and he says, do you want to sell this place? Now, she goes, yeah, I think so. So she was going to sell from a guy from out of town. Uh, local magicians were upset. Uh, Tom's wife was surprised. They were supposed to just come here and visit, and he's buying a business and staying here. And so um, he had uh, not a lot of knowledge about uh, magic, uh, and, and he would admit to it if he was standing here. And uh, so I just stumbled in in the same way uh, one day. Uh, my girlfriend was actually in there to buy me uh, a gift, and... Uh, she saw the new people there and told me, and I came down and said, you want to demonstrate? And he said, yes. So I started working at Eagle Magic Store for a dollar and a quarter an hour. <laughs> and What year uh, would this be? Can you... 1970. Okay. I also got all the shows and all the classes that I could create. That was the deal. And then all of a sudden, that worked out very well for me. I was doing classes, and people were coming in and taking these classes. It was from um, uh, 9 until 10 in the morning in the back room behind the stage. I had kids coming in, taking classes, and then I had to do a second hour from 10 to uh, 11. And I had uh, names that you would know that uh, I could mention, and... Uh, then uh, I was teaching uh, Wednesday night adult classes from 6 until 7. Uh, on Sunday, I was going out to the Jewish Community Center in St. Louis Park and teaching classes. So I was doing shows, teaching classes, selling tricks seven days a week for many, many, many years. And uh, that's the great thing about magic and having this excitement about it is you might love the ukulele, or you might uh, know how to juggle a little bit, and you might uh, be able to play the piano a bit, and all your family and friends think you're amusing, but that's not like levitating a dollar bill, which is a miracle. <laughs> right. Yes. And so we can take as a magician all the kudos and applause for these types of things, where in some instances... Not so difficult to do. Now, I would never sell a beginner a floating dollar bill. I would never so sell a beginner a thumb tip. I would no, never sell a beginner an invisible deck or a brainwave deck. Again, you have to be this gatekeeper. But now online, and that's why, you know, the end is near. When my people come in here that are smarter than me, what the hell am I doing here for? Yeah. Yeah. 
the I mean that idea is certainly in the books. Uncle Harry, who runs the magic store, is exactly <laughs> what you've described. He will not sell somebody something that they shouldn't have, and really, until you can demonstrate proficiency in what he already sold you, you're not getting the next thing. Yeah. So that that's an interesting concept that, of course, now is completely gone because you can get whatever you want whenever you want it online. Correct. Yeah. So that's an it, it's fascinating to talk about that. Talk. Talk a little bit about the, uh, you know, over the years, lots of celebrities have come into Eagle Magic, so not just famous magicians, True. although you've had your share of those too, but Muhammad Ali, and, yes. I mean, there's a lot of people that have come through here. Yeah, and he came in here a couple times, and once uh, for a long time, he spent uh, $1,000, and that takes a while to do sometimes, and uh, it wasn't like he was trying to throw money at me, at me like some uh, do. And, uh, you know, so Harry Connick Jr. called me up on the phone one day and said, uh, you got any magic tricks? I go, yeah. He says, you got any jokes? I go, yeah. I tell you what, that's why I call it Eagle Magic and Jokes. <laughs> and so uh, he says, well, this is Harry Connick Jr. Yeah. And I go like, yeah, and this is Harry Houdini. Yeah. Uh, who, by the way, was friends with Colin Spence. Houdini sat at this desk I have in the back room right You're now. You're kidding. No, in 1915, when he did an aerial straitjacket escape in downtown Minneapolis, he used to be in the store for those days in a row. Um, so uh, Muhammad Ali was in here. And uh, so he was came in for, uh, in 1991, it was a Super Bowl, and it was being... Uh, Howard Cosell was doing the color, much like you were doing the color for the twins. Sure. And uh, so now they keep zooming into the box that uh, Muhammad Ali is sitting in with his posse, who had just been in the store, and uh, with a bunch of kids. He came in with his nephews and their buddies, and there was two limos that drove up to Eagle Magic Store. They all jumped out, ran around for an hour and a half, then left for Get Pizza, and he stayed with me for six hours. So the next day, when they keep panning into this box at the stadium, Howard Cosell says he's playing with something between his legs. And the other guy who's next to him says, I think he's eating peanuts. And then somebody else, they keep panning back two or three times, and somebody says he's playing one of those number puzzles where you move the 15 numbers around to get him in order. I'm the only one in the, in the world who knows what he's doing. He's playing with magic tricks that I taught him the day before. <laughs> I don't know if I mentioned this to you or not. I can confirm that. Every, when people would go into the Sexton building, is with the building I was in, and they go to the restaurant and say, Muhammad Ali is next door, and then they go upstairs and say, this. so there's about 25 people are watching me selling magic tricks. And at one point, he stopped, and he said, let me show you guys a trick. And he did the Balducci self-levitation trick. So he turned his back on the audience, and he raised himself up off the ground. And people really gasped. They were really quiet. And uh, he came back down, and I said, wow. And I started to applaud, and everybody applauded. And we came back, and I said, you guys are going to have to go now. So I shooed those people out of the store. And I just turned the sign over and so said, it's closed. You, know, you, you learn things occasionally. Right. Like, you know, hey, there's an idea. Yeah. But closed on the damn door. <laughs> <laughs> if people want to learn something, you know, sometimes they'll come in and say, we want the dancing cane because we're doing this. And I go like, well, let's talk about this. But I sold a lot of tricks to people at the Guthrie Children's Theater, Cricket Theater, Theater in the Round. And uh, they would come in for specific things. Mm -hmm. You know, if you need to produce a cigarette from your fingertips from damn Yankees and you don't know how to do it. So, uh, and I had a great time with these people that would come in. I helped with uh, 500 hats at Children's Theater with that concept of the hats. Uh, and that, uh, they were very thankful for that. I helped with Pinocchio's nose. That was a big deal. They went over the world with that show. Mm -hmm. I did... Uh, I know you helped me with corporate stuff where I would come in and ask for... I need something silly right here that makes sense here. Like, yeah, uh, and you were happy to just take our buddy. <laughs> yeah, and you know, there's guys that have done that. They said, "I'm getting on a plane later on today, and I'm going to mess around with whatever I get from you uh, tonight." 
but I want you to make me look good. I've never met this person before. I've got $100 to spend, and I've kind of done, you know, flash paper. And, uh, you know, in the whole flash paper story is sometimes in the recent past, people will come in, and I'll always ask, have you used this before? And uh, they'll go, yeah. And some guy uh, a couple weeks ago came in the next day, threw the flash paper envelope on the counter and said, this doesn't work. And he was upset. I'm going like, what are you talking about? It doesn't work. That's like saying an apple doesn't work. <laughs> and he said, did you dry it? I was like, what do you mean? I said, it comes wet. You have to dry it out. He goes, no, I didn't dry it out. He said, you, said, you said you knew what was going on with this stuff. And I go like, well, you lied. And uh, people bring back nickels to dimes, and it'll look like somebody was pounding on it with a hammer. Or they'll come in and say, uh, this gimmick that you were talking about isn't in here. I go like, yeah, it is. And they'll be mad, and I'll go, I'll tell you what, you get out a $100 bill and put it here, I'll get out a $100 bill and put it here, and then we'll see if that nickel fake is in there or not. They get real quiet. Yeah. When we started this discussion, you said, yeah, Chip Cunningham would like a Glorpy. And yeah. this, these are the things that you know about your customers. You know that about me. And yeah. I came in here, uh, you know, had been coming in here for years. And I walked in one, one day and you said, Cunningham, a book came in the other day that you've been waiting for your entire life. And Did I, I said, sell you Spirit Theater? Yeah, you sold me Spirit Theater. And, and, it, and really, truthfully, a, a case could be made that we are sitting here today because you sold me that book. Yeah, that, that's true. You know, I had an interest in magic, but I never wanted to perform it until I read Spirit Theater and then went, now this is the magic I would like to perform. Uh, and so that's that concept of you knowing somebody and being able to say, ah, the next time I see him, I'm going to tell him about this and that and, yeah. and mentoring young performers. Yes. You've done it, uh, that for many people, people that we've had on this podcast. And there's some uh, times, you know, I can't, uh, uh, you know, pat myself on the back too much in the sense that. You do want to interview the person a little bit, or you get to know them a little bit, and uh, you know there's certain good tricks that are just uh, smart to have. And again, having something that allows you to have success with it. When you come back and you say, I had a great time with this. See, people want to do more of something when they succeed. If you fail at something or people point at you at laughs, or that isn't good. And so the magic store dealer and the magic shop can help people be successful and those people can go on and become entrepreneurial and clever and practice and rehearse and study about lighting and, you know, sound and all these things that embellish your show. And, uh, and the idea of saying to somebody, you really should have this book, you should really have this trick, I've done that, and in many instances they get it, and if there's some great thing that uh, you have, not necessarily some exclusivity, but some knowledge of or some handling of, so often people would get, for example, a dancing cane. It's just not something easily done. You have to have the motion. It is a certain thing you have to do. That's different than a die box. I mean, it's even different than multiplying balls, which you can do kind of right when you get them in your hand. But you can't do a dancing cane, or you can't uh, float a dollar bill. So, uh, but this, it this was great. great fun. Just great, yeah. Uh, what have we missed? The only thing you, you've touched on this a little bit about how you know things have changed now with the with the internet and in, in terms of yeah. of that. Uh, just talk a little bit about how owning a magic store has has changed in your just in your tenure. Well, that is a good question, and sometimes I have to be thankful. Uh, and I have had been kind of lucky, but I try not to let things bother me. If I let things bother me, I would have stopped doing this in the past 10 years because things do bother me regarding this. And so it's changed, and uh, more people are selling things that don't have the right to sell them, and that would be like 
you know, provenance or who did create things and all the arguments you will sometimes hear. I don't go on some of these websites and they're kind of cool and I can see where people would be distracted by them. And I know it's fun to jabber about these things endlessly and I think people like to do that, mm -hmm. you know. But the one thing I could say that I've really had to make some concessions and say, I, I'm, I made enough money where if somebody comes in, that's fine. If they don't want to come in, that's fine. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. Uh, I'm going to write this book. Maybe somebody will take over Eagle Magic Store in the future. There'll be a retired person who just wants some place, a physical place they can go to. They can work on their collection. They can work on their tricks. They can teach more classes than me. They can do more shows than me. But they can just take up the name type of a thing and have a little office. So, But now with technology, when people come in, they have seen me do demonstrations. They have read the newspaper articles, the magazine articles, the radio interviews, the TV interviews, the lectures that I've hosted. I've hosted over a hundred magic lectures. And uh, they know who I am. They come in, they're very polite. They want to buy some tricks. How much should we spend, they say. And I let them know. And then they want to take a picture. And they want to do these different selfies. And I say, let's stand over here by the gorilla, or let's stand over here by the table, or I've got these glasses the kids can put on. They're like bunny glasses or a funny hat. And uh, so they know they're coming here to visit the magic store. And some people who have come in, they say, is this a museum? And I say, yes, it is. And there's usually the cover charge, but I'm going to let you in free. <laughs> <laughs> That is uh, Larry Kahlo in a nutshell. So let's just unpack this for one second. If Larry right. hadn't recommended Eugene's book to you, you would not have done your show uh, in the Wabasha Caves. Mm -hmm. And I would not have seen it and talked to you about magic. And then there would be no Eli Marks series, no audiobooks, no podcast. All it that is because you walked into a store and a store owner, a magic store owner, knew you enough to say, Hey, Cunningham, a book came in this week that you waited your whole life for. It seems like we're overstating that, but I don't think we are. I, I really think that, you know, you can go back to moments in your life. Sometimes, you know, oh, that was uh, that's where that happened. This is this is true. Uh, he had that book set aside for me, knowing that that was my particular uh, bailiwick. And um, uh, that led to the show uh, and my friendship and uh, mentorship by Eugene Berger, which um, led to us uh, discussing magic, yeah. which led to you writing mysteries about a magician. Yeah, so it's it's a pretty clear line there from A genealogy, to B. Genealogy, maybe. I don't know, that's probably not the right word, but. What word did you use? Your genealogy? Yeah, it's a genealogy oh, of an oh, idea, oh, sure, oh, why not? Oh, that's yeah. the DNA, we found the DNA of it. Exactly, it's very cool. And anyway, uh, it was quite fun to be sitting there and have that little light bulb go over our heads and go, oh my goodness. If he hadn't said that, then uh, everything been. else would have been something else. However, I, I must say out of the whole interview, my favorite quote of all was talking to the guy who had not, uh, was having trouble with the flash paper and saying flash paper doesn't work. And uh, Larry saying, uh, that's like saying an apple doesn't work. Yes. And I guarantee you that will show up in an Eli Marks book at some I point. I can't wait. I, I look forward to that little quote. There were a, a bunch of memorable uh, quotes. Do you, do you sell the dancing cane? Yes, I do, but not to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just, and that's the beauty of having somebody. I, I mean, take nothing away. I'm, I'm grateful for the online magic source, too, because I do uh, get stuff that I want from the online magic stores that sometimes your in-town magic store might not have right away right. and you can grab it quick. So I take nothing away from them. They've done a tremendous service to the magic community and united it in, in many different ways. But there is something uh, special about having a local magic store, especially one with um, as much history and goodness to it as, uh, as our store here does Eagle Magic. Yeah, it's... It's been a huge resource for me personally, because, you know, as we know, I don't know that much about magic. And on more than one occasion, I have called Larry to ask him a question, uh, such as uh, one time I called and said, did you ever buy something you regretted? And immediately uh, he had a story about uh, a prop that he'd bought that he thought he could resell and he's never been able to resell it. And um, 
that just went boom right into one of the books uh, as something that Harry had bought and, and was unable to unload. Um, and that's a, it just gives the books that uh, verisimilitude. Ooh, uh, nice word. Thank it's you. Much better than genealogy. Well, I don't know. That's, I think they could fight it out, those two words. <laughs> Anyway, the other thing that I thought was interesting is we've now had two interviews with people who've talked about magic with Muhammad Ali. Yeah, isn't that weird? Yeah, Larry and then Jeff Altman as well. Both had encounters uh, with the champ uh, doing magic. So Very, very fun. And he's got so much stuff. Hey, listen, if you're ever in the Twin Cities area, it's worth your time. If you're a magician, if you're not a magician, to stick your head in Eagle Magic Store. Uh, and poke around a little bit. He's got so much there, just scads and scads and scads of historical magic that you can look at or perhaps yeah. buy. I bought a great uh, uh, Alexander, the man who knows poster uh, from Larry that uh, is framed in, in my basement. Have you uh, sat at the Houdini desk in the back? The desk that Houdini? I never have sat at the Houdini desk. I've seen desk. it. I've just never sat at it. That's right. I've seen it, but yeah. I've, never, uh, I've never said, can I sit at it? So. And, and for those of you listeners who I won't be in the uh, Burnsville, Minneapolis, St. Paul area. Uh, we've uh, we've got a little video on our YouTube page uh, that we shot that gives you a sense of what's going on inside that store. And he, uh, Larry even does a little bit of magic in it. So you get a sense of what Eagle Magic is like. So just head on over to the show notes and there's a, a link there or just go right to our behind the page YouTube page uh, and you can see that. You'll also, I found a link from a 1981 news report that had Larry in it performing. So you can kind of compare Larry in uh, 1981 to Larry today performing by looking at those two links. Yeah. So I, pretty cool. Good for you to find that. That's great. Um, it, it, such a charming man, such a uh, influence on magic here in Minnesota and really the five state area, because he's got such a, a length and breadth of uh, experience, but time uh, owning a magic store. Goodness. Yeah. So thanks again to Larry Kahlo for spending that time with us and for really being the uh, the genesis for the Eli Marks Mystery Series. And speaking of the Eli Marks Mystery Series, uh, before we jump into you reading chapter nine of The Bullet Catch, let me just quickly recap what happened in chapter eight. Eli is on the film set. He's been talking to the producer Arnold. He's got a call from his agent uh, about a, a house party that they wanted to do in, uh, in town. He, he witnesses some hanky-panky between the star and the lead actress. And then he meets uh, that night for the first time, he meets Mr. Lime. And we uh, move into the Mr. Lime phase of this book. That's what happened in chapter eight, which takes us right now into chapter nine. The Bullet Catch, an Eli Marks mystery. Chapter nine. Did you enjoy your sojourn into the depraved depths of real Hollywood filmmaking? These were the first words out of Jake's mouth when I answered his early morning call. I had just finished getting dressed, my hair still wet from the shower and jutting out in all directions. I squinted and rubbed some water out of my eyes, trying to remember where I had put my shoes. It's a small apartment, but some days it's the equivalent of a black hole for footwear. Enjoy? I wouldn't go that far, but it was intriguing. That's quite the dysfunctional bouillabaisse you've got brewing out there. I started listing off the key players to make sure I had them all clear in my head. You've got Donna and Arnold, the divorced producers who hate each other and share a hatred for the director. You've got Stuart, the writer who hates the director, and the leading lady, Noel, who's making the rounds through the above-the-line folks like a bad cold. And you've got Walter, the director with the explosive temper who hates the writer and the producers. And I'm assuming one or more of that group hates you, if not all of them. In short, you've got a lot of unhappy campers on that set, any one of whom would benefit from my untimely death, Jake said. And it grows larger every day. But the simple fact is, while they may all hate each other right now, if this movie is a hit... It will be nothing but a love fest as they laugh all the way to the bank. And you'll be laughing as well? Depends, Jake said. If I'm alive, I've got net points right off the back end. But between you and me, if I'm dead, 
my interest in making money diminishes considerably. So you still joining me for first Thursday? There was a pause on the other end of the phone. Eli, after what happened at the reunion, I'm not sure I can ever get on a stage again. Oh, come on, do five minutes. As my Aunt Alice used to say, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I feel like I already have enough things trying to kill me. Well, let's have dinner on Thursday, and you can decide then whether to sign up for a slot or not. Another pregnant pause on the other end of the phone. Okay he finally said. You sure you don't need me on the set today? Jake laughed. Not likely. Walter fired the key grip and Arnold fired the caterer, so I don't think much is going to get shot today, least of all me. How are you going to spend your day off? I was going to say therapy, but it came out as, oh, I don't know, running some errands. Sounds like fun. You have no idea. By the time I headed downstairs, Uncle Harry had not only opened the store, but by the sound of laughter I heard was already entertaining an early morning patron. I couldn't have been more surprised to see the customer was none other than Clive Albans. The British journalist, looking like a scarecrow dressed for a 60s-themed costume party, was seated on a stool while Harry stood behind the counter demonstrating a trick for him. I was surprised to see it was a variation of the trick I had come up with for Jake and the kid, but using a completely different method. Given your love of scarves and handkerchiefs, I think this trick will serve your purpose as well, Harry was saying in his distinct salesman patter. If I may borrow your pocket square? Clive, with wide-eyed enthusiasm, carefully plucked his chartreuse silk from his breast pocket and handed it to Harry. Harry took one end of the silk and, making a fist with his other hand, began to stuff the silk into his clenched fist. The secret of this trick, he said to Clive as he continued to push the silk into his fist, is not only the magician, but also the audience must believe it's possible for the handkerchief to vanish. Do you believe? Oh, yes, by all means, I believe. Goodness, yes. Clive was nearly panting with anticipation. Harry gave the silk one more firm push into the fist with his thumb and then pulled his hand away, placing his closed fist just inches from Clive's face. Do you believe? Mr. Marx, you have my word. I am, in fact, a believer. And so it shall be. Harry opened his fist, slowly uncurling each finger, finally revealing an empty palm. Clive whooped and clapped his hands together in delight. Oh, that's marvelous, he chirped. I covet it. I must possess it. He looked over and noticed me for the first time. Oh, Eli, it is a delight, a delight. It will provide the shock and awe I do so crave. Perfect, I said, heading toward the register. The first sale of the day. Nonsense, Harry said, waving a hand dismissively at me as he packed the gimmick for the trick carefully into its container. For our friend Mr. Albans, this is gratis. I guarantee we'll make back tenfold based on his continued goodwill. For a second, I thought I might still be dreaming. The idea Harry was not only giving something away, but giving it to a non-magician and a journalist to boot was almost too outrageous to believe. My mouth slightly agape, I watched as he put the box trick into a bag and handed it across the counter to Clive. With my compliments, Harry said. Sir, you are too kind by half, Clive said as he took the bag. You have made my day, nay, my week. I shall delight in your largesse and sing your praises to all and sundry. Harry walked him to the door, nodding and smiling. Thank you kindly, Mr. Marx, Clive continued as Harry opened the door for him. For this lovely illusion, as well as the ideas and insight you have provided. He held up his small reporter's notebook, placing it with care in his front breast pocket, giving it a pat once it slid 
snugly into place. You've offered some true food for thought, and I assure you, I will masticate it thoroughly as I continue to digest your wisdom. Happy to help, Harry said, smiling as he held the door open a tad wider. Clive tipped his hat to me. Eli, good to see you again. And with that, he nearly skipped out of the store. Harry swung the door shut behind him, giving it an extra push until he heard the satisfying snick of the latch. Good Lord, what a tiresome pots, he sighed as he headed back across the store toward me. Really, I said, it looked to me like the two of you were getting along swimmingly. A magician is an actor playing the part of a magician, Harry said, quoting a favorite phrase from the famous French magician Robert Houdin and never more so than around the tedious Mr. Albans. So what information did you give him that got him so excited, I asked, as Harry passed me. He picked up my iPad off the counter. Ah, oh, Buster, I just verified some generalities he had misconstrued, he said with a long sigh. By the way, your iPad needs charging. I'm going to make some tea. Would you like some? Not waiting for my answer, he parted the red velvet curtain that separates the front of the store from the back and disappeared into our workroom. I watched him withdraw and then started rummaging around behind the counter to see where the charger cord for the iPad had gone, wondering why the battery had run down so quickly. An irrational fear is just as terrifying as a real fear. To your brain, they are one and the same. Yeah, I said, I think I read that in a fortune cookie once. Dr. Baki produced his first sigh in our session, undoubtedly inspired by my glib response and also by the sad realization there would likely be many more sighs to come. I think you know what I mean. I do, I said. Half of my brain knew the fear was irrational and the other half was too busy being scared to death. My recommendation had been to only go up two or three floors at most. Tell that to the reunion committee. They clearly had other ideas. Did the breathing exercises have any impact? I'm not sure, I admitted. To be honest, I'm not sure how much actual breathing I was doing. So you made it up to the ballroom 40 floors in a glass elevator. Do we have to discuss this? I asked, feeling a bit queasy and weak-kneed at the memory. Maybe I'm wrong, but isn't that the primary reason for your visits here, to talk about this? Now it was my turn to sigh. Yes, I suppose you have a point. And then you were able to come down 40 stories, also in a glass elevator? Coming down was easier. Dr. Baki looked up from his pad. And why do you think that was? The addition of alcohol? Could be, I agreed. I also had a beautiful woman holding my hand and singing Christmas carols. Christmas carols? I nodded. It helped to take my mind off things. He cocked his head to one side. That's interesting. Which do you think had the greater impact? The beautiful woman holding your hand or the Christmas carol? I'm not sure. As my Uncle Harry is fond of saying, it's probably a horse apiece. I could tell from his blank expression that Dr. Baki didn't have a relative who peppered him with such folksy kernels of wisdom, so I added, you know, six of one, half a dozen of another. Dr. Baki nodded and made another note. It would be interesting, he said almost to himself, to run a controlled experiment, put you under those same conditions twice once with just the beautiful woman and once with only the Christmas carol option. He glanced over at me, and I think he could register from my expression that experiments were not currently on my bucket list. He made a note. Well, if it turns out immersion therapy doesn't work, there are several other options we can pursue with your therapy, he said. I think you're a good candidate for EMDR, and I also think You'd be a good subject for hypnotism, he stopped. Why are you smirking? 
Hypnotism, I said. I'm sorry, it's a thing in my family. A prejudice against hypnotism, I guess you'd call it. A bad experience? Sort of, I said. My uncle had a bad experience, and if he found out I was involved in hypnotism in any way, he would, well, I don't know what the technical term is, but he would have a cow. Dr. Bakke consulted his notes. This would be Uncle Harry, the performer? Yes, he's a magician, I said. And he had a bad experience with hypnotism. Actually, it was with a hypnotist. His name was Oracle, the hypnotist. He and Harry shared the bill on several tours through the Midwest. This was years and years ago. Dr. Bakke sat back, waiting for me to continue. Anyway, Oracle had this assistant, this girl he worked with, a really pretty girl, and Uncle Harry was a young guy, and he was, I think the term he used was, he was sweet on her. They had met at a party one of the performers had thrown, and Harry thought they really hit it off. So he asked Oracle about her, and Oracle said, Oh, no, Harry, she doesn't like you. She told me so. She doesn't like magicians, and she doesn't like you. So Harry was sort of devastated by this, and Oracle said to him, Harry, if you want, I could hypnotize her so that she likes you. Well, Harry wasn't a big believer in hypnotism, but she was a pretty girl, so he said, Sure, go ahead. I could tell Dr. Bakke was caught up in the story, He'd set his pen down and was leaning forward. He nodded for me to continue. So the next day, Oracle tells Harry he hypnotized her. Harry summons all his courage and goes up to her and asks her out. Well, she's delighted. Oh, that would be wonderful, she says. Thank you, Harry. I've been waiting for you to ask me out. On and on like that. Anyway, so they go out, have a great time, and they start dating. Then Harry finds out from one of the stagehands that the girl had asked Oracle to fix her up with Harry. Turns out, Oracle had made up the whole thing about her not liking Harry and hypnotizing her. It was all a prank. When Harry found that out, he was furious, but what could he do? I mean, in the end, he got the girl, but he was always irked Oracle had tricked him, and as a consequence, he's had issues with hypnotists ever since. And the best part of the story, I added, is he ended up marrying the girl, and they were together for over 50 years. Charming story, Dr. Bakke said, but before he could continue, I cut in. And there's more, I said. Harry made the mistake of telling her, my Aunt Alice, the whole thing, about his conversation with Oracle and how he was tricked by him and how annoyed he was. And Alice never let him forget it. Sometimes, if anyone ever snapped their fingers around her, she would sit up, suddenly startled, and say, Where am I? Who are you? I was just talking to Oracle, and now where am I? It drove Harry wild. I smiled at the memory of Aunt Alice's little act and realized I hadn't thought about that story since she had died. Anyway, I said, let's leave hypnotism as a last resort. Not a problem, Dr. Bakke said, and then I think he noticed the change in my expression. What's wrong? I shrugged. I don't know, I said as I tried to put the feelings into words. I just suddenly got sad. Because of the story about your Aunt Alice? No, I said, shaking my head, because I just realized that I won't share a memory like that with Megan, something we laugh about for 50 years, and part of me sort of thought we would. We were quiet for a few moments, and then Dr. Bakke softly cleared his throat before speaking. <clears throat> I know you believe your experience last fall, the murders, being a prime suspect, and the dangerous situations you were in were stressful, he said slowly. But I'm wondering if this separation with Megan, which she calls a break, but that you're registering more as a breakup, might actually be a greater stressor. I thought it over. It may well be, I admitted. And her showing up the other night and then disappearing again certainly isn't reducing that stress. No, it's not. And I think stress, like that, as well as what you experienced last fall, is what's behind these attacks. So, if you don't mind, let's spend a few minutes talking about you and Megan. Okay, I began, and before I knew it, 
my hour was up. All right, that's chapter nine of the bullet catcher. We got to see uh, Harry being nice for once to that British reporter, Clive Albans. I'm not sure where that's headed, but I'm guessing Harry's not being nice just to be nice. And we also got to hear that story about how Harry, how Harry met Eli's Aunt Alice in the early days of his career. Fun to get a sense of Harry's younger self. I've occasionally thought about doing a prequel series you know, Harry in the 40s and 50s as a young magician, but I simply don't have the energy. <laughs> well, if you don't, I certainly don't. So it's good. Speaking of energy, uh, we're putting some energy out here with this podcast. And I heard from a listener this past week um, who said they were listening to uh, the podcast and heard us talking about the amazing Burt Wonderstone and they had never seen it. So they uh, watched it and sent me a little note that said, holy mackerel, I'm going to take you, your, your, the two of you and your advice on just about everything from now on, because I enjoy that out of that. Well, that's going to that's gonna end badly for everybody. But yeah. they're right about that movie. Uh, it, it is a charming little film. Charming, really? charming, charming little film. Like I said, if you want to see, uh, see what Eagle Magic looks like, we've got a, a nice little video on the YouTube page and also video of Larry from uh, his younger days. And in our next episode, we're going to continue on the topic of building a better magician. We're going to talk to another local legend, uh, magician Noah Sony. Oh, great guy. Looking forward to that. Hey, we first met Noah uh, when we started producing Sunday Night Magic, right? Yeah, that's right. Yep. He and came to volunteer and, and eventually became an integral part of the team. Yeah, it was absolutely clear almost from the moment we met him that he was uh, a magician to watch and a, uh, potentially a friend indeed. Uh, yeah. He's a terrific guy. Um, we're going to talk to him and uh, find out about his origin story, which, you know, uh, he's a younger kid. So it's interesting to hear uh, his perspective on how he got involved in magic at the Mall of America and doing regular restaurant work and corporate college gigs. He's, Really, when you think of it, John, as we try to talk about, you know, building a better magician, he's certainly uh, a perfect example about how you could be smart and intentional about building yourself into a good magician. Yeah, he's he's made, I think, all the right moves. And it's an interesting conversation to talk about how, how he did that and just the sheer amount of work that went into it. It looks easy from the outside, but uh, he put in uh, a a lot of hours to get to where uh, he is now, which is a very polished, very charming, uh, very funny performer. Yeah, absolutely. And a nice guy. On top Great of guy. all of that, right. Yep. So that's coming up next, Noah Sony. Uh, listen, be sure to check out those bonus videos that John is always so kind uh, to provide us. They are uh, on the Behind the Page YouTube channel. There's even some of your feature films there I saw. There's a bunch of stuff you can, people can look at. I'm always adding stuff. So uh, just, if you subscribe to that YouTube page, you'll be notified anytime one of the podcast episodes goes up, anytime we put up a, a clip of something. Uh, it's just a good way to do that. Or just subscribe directly to the podcast. And if you want, leave us a little rating. That's a, that's a huge help. It really is. We really appreciate that. So that's it for 209. Next time, we're going to do chapter 10 of the Bullet Catch and have a great chat with uh, a magician to watch, Mr. Noah Sony. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. This has been Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and Jim Cunningham, produced by Albert's Bridge Books at Grass Lake Studios. Find this podcast and all the books in the Eli Marks series at elimarksmysteries.com. That's E-L-I-M-A-R-K-S, mysteries.com. And thanks for listening. Thank you.